I uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. I, I've gotten to speak in a lot of different places, but I never get to hit four cities in once. <laughs> so I apologize if I, if I mess this up. But so Tidewater, Norfolk, uh, Hampton Road, and uh, <laughs> anyway, and Virginia Beach. So uh, four for four. Baseball, not bad. So uh, it's an honor to be here, and uh, I want to thank the Federation, the CRC, and everyone for, for bringing me here. It's my first trip. It's, it's been a kind of a long day. I got into the U.S. at 4 a.m. this morning. I was in Jordan and Israel, and so the time difference, uh, if, you, if there's something I don't explain well, blame me because of the time, but I, uh, I made a commitment to come here, and I want to keep my word, so here I am, and uh, they've kept me busy all day, so, it, but it's an honor to cap it off with a, with a you know, standing room only crowd here, um, and um, it's an honor to be here. Look, last week, we've, uh, we was the 65th anniversary of the birth of Israel, according to the secular calendar. And because we live in such tumultuous times, that this is indeed, you know, um, with the Arab upheaval, spring, whatever you want to call it, uh, such an unbelievable period. Uh, like I say, if, if, if someone, we were here two years ago and they said this fruit vendor in Tunisia is going to set himself on fire and the Tunisian government's going to fall, and then with a month later, Mubarak and Egypt's going to fall and Bahrain is going to go wobbly, and Gaddafi is going to fall, and Syria is going to be launched into a, a brutal civil war, and go on and on in Yemen, and, and, and there's no end uh, to all the changes. They'd say, you're on drugs, there's no way this is going to happen. But here we are. But I think sometimes you could get overwhelmed by challenges too. And so I want to offer a little start out before we get to all the hot spots. I'm, I'm going to focus on three of them, uh, and, and then I look forward to the discussion. I think sometimes history helps us put things in context to know that we are not the first generation to be tested in crisis. Uh, 65 years ago, David Ben-Gurion had a very tough call to make. And I just want to talk to you about the 24-hour period in Ben-Gurion's life before they decided to declare the state of Israel, which carried by a six to four vote. It was enough that one person changed his vote, it would have been a flat tie. And that was all about 48 hours before the state was declared. He had his, the person who went on to be foreign minister, Moshe Sharet, then called Moshe Shertak, had just come from a meeting with George Marshall in the United States. Marshall was, the, of course, the hero of World War II, and who was you know, vitriolically against the formation of Israel, told Harry Truman, I'm not sure I'm going to vote for you, Mr. President. Something that not too many secretaries of state would say to their president in an election year. And he, he said to Charette, he said, listen, uh, I won't, you know, I've had some experience in World War II, and uh, I know one thing, these generals, they always paint rosy scenarios. I'm asking you not to listen to your generals. They'll tell you you could win easily. I'm not so sure you can win. I think you should postpone this thing of a state. Maybe we'll get the Arabs to reconsider. But, uh, you know, this is not a good time. And Sharet said there's never a good time. And uh, he said, I want you to go back to Ben-Gurion and tell him my views. And, and Sharet did that. As a matter of fact, there was, no, there was a boycott on all incoming aviation. He had to fly to Greece and then took, he went to, took a private plane on a, like a dark uh, lit uh, small plane uh, and to, in Tel Aviv where it wasn't an airport and he went to Ben-Gurion's home and he said, you know, George Marshall says we can't win. And I think he's right. And Ben-Gurion said, tomorrow's the big meeting. I want you to give the full part of what Marshall told you, but I'm asking you not to say that last sentence. And Charette said, that's fine. But, you know, you've got the guy who's like your proto-foreign minister quoting the hero of World War II, basically saying you can't win. Then he had another case where there had been some under-the-table under understandings with the leader of Jordan, King Abdullah I. Now we have King Abdullah II in Jordan, which we'll talk about this evening. But uh, 
King Abdullah had basically, and Golda Meir, who was dressed up as a, a Bedouin woman and, and covertly went into Jordan, had gone to see him in November and said, we're, we're, we'll share this land with you. You know, you just, you take the, the East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and you don't attack us, we don't attack you. You don't have to say that you're not attacking us, you just don't attack us, that's all. And he said, I like that idea. But in May, when everything was coming to a boil, because the British were ending their mandate at midnight on May 15th, um, uh, she went again to double check. And he said, well, I know I told you that in November, but things have changed. He said, then I was one, now I'm five. Because there were five Arab armies poised to attack Israel the minute it declared the state at midnight. So I'm saying to you, uh, what's the rush? And this sounds like a Jewish comedian humor, but it's a true story. She said, what's the rush? It's been 2,000 years. <laughs> you know, this sounds like, it's like a Jackie Mason line. But it was really the true story of the transcripts. What's the rush? 2,000 years is a long time to read. So he just said, look, I, I, I really don't want to be in this war. But I'm, a, I'm an Arab country. I can't sit this out. I have nothing I could do. I'm very sorry. I, the plan was a good plan that, you know, that, that the Palestinian part of the partition the Jordanians would take, but I can't live up to it and uh, I'm sorry. As a matter of fact, that was the third piece of bad news on her way out that she saw the Arab Legion uh, already amassing at Gush Etzion where there was a Jewish uh, village and the, the Jews there get wiped out in Gush Etzion, south of Jerusalem. Um, and uh, so, basically, you're David Ben-Gurion, and this is what you got in 24 hours. And you gotta make a call. And, uh, and you got Charette citing George Marshall that you can't win this war, and he's the hero of World War II. You got King Abdullah, of, then it was called Transjordan, then it becomes known as Jordan, saying, well, I didn't want to attack you, but the Arabs, other governments are giving me no choice but to attack you. I'm sorry, I would like to have set it up, but I can't. And he's saying, why don't, he comes up with this idea that she said nobody will go for it, that why don't you be a, in a, a Jewish like community in, in an Arab country, and, and you'll be part of the country of Jordan under my kingship. And he said, sorry, well, you know, we didn't wait this long. To, you know, to be like a, a subunit of, of an Arab country. Um, and then you've got the fighting at Gush Etzion, where the Jewish community is wiped out. And Ben-Gurion has got to make a call under these circumstances, knowing that five Arab armies are going to attack him if he declares the state. But for Ben-Gurion, timing was everything. And he thought the constellation of the fact that the British were leaving that the United States, uh, under Truman, they, they felt that Truman was going to declare support them. That would not last because the forces at the State Department were pretty arrayed against uh, the whole Zionist enterprise, thinking Ben Gurion has, I mean, that Truman has kind of fallen under the spell for election purposes. By the way, he loses New York in the election, but still wins the 48 election. So those who said it was all about winning the state of New York got it wrong. But, um, but sometimes timing isn't, you know, just one factor, it's the only factor. And Ben-Gurion felt that leadership meant you have to act. You need really sometimes in leadership four factors. You need a sense of uh, what I call the four C's. You need conviction, a vision, right? You've got to be able to utilize circumstance to advance your vision, your, your conviction. Uh, timing, like I say, is everything. You need courage. That means political courage, sometimes physical courage, both. And you need credibility, right? I mean, the people have got to believe that if you're making a decision, they may agree or disagree, but they don't question the motivation of your love of country because you come down on one side of an issue. And Ben-Gurion had all four C's. He had the conviction, he, he, ha he knew how to utilize circumstance to advance that conviction. He had amazing courage that he felt that the Yeshuv was ready for five nation onslaught. If you remember, 
The Haganah was more of a paramilitary kind of organization fighting guerrilla warfare, and he reshaped it. Uh, he, he immersed himself in military books and said, we need people who can fight a conventional war against armies. That's what we're going to face. We're not going to just face people's snipers behind rocks. We're going to face formations. And he chose people who had fought on the British side in World War II because he wanted the, the new Tzahal, the, the Israeli Defense Forces, to reflect a regular army, not just a guerrilla ragtag uh, group uh, fighting uh, snipers. And so he had that courage and he had the credibility of his devotion to Zionism. So that took enormous leadership. But he wasn't taking reckless risks. He was someone who thought you had to take prudent risks. He felt that you had to say you're going to share the land. The Palestinians turned it down. The Arab League turned it down. They thought the whole idea of a Zionist enterprise was illegitimate. And who, who are they to say they'll take half a loaf? They deserve no loaf. Uh, but he knew to take calculated risks. And, and that timing proved to be you know, prescient. And uh, the rest is history, as they say. So I, I think it's important sometimes to remember that big decisions require big leaders. Because we think now that we're facing decisions that no one else has faced. But I would argue that Ben-Gurion would love to be in the position in many ways that Israel is in today. Uh, that Israel, although with the exception of Iran, which we'll speak about, which is a nuclear threat and, and nothing to, you know, to be, um, you know, nothing to minimize at all. But in the case of Egypt, in the case of Syria, maybe a little bit in the case of Jordan, the fear is not that the Arabs are too strong, but that the Arab state structure will dissipate and that the biggest fear of Israel is that the traditional state system that Israel has known and started with you could say with Sykes-Picot in World War I that is that coming apart and if the Arab state system collapses who's going to patrol borders who is the central address the Ketovet as they say in Hebrew the the source of accountability that Israel could that Israel could hold accountable if the state structure collapses. Now people say, what, this is the biggest problem, the Arabs are too weak. But the problem is, is that we don't know, we have porous borders today. And that means that tactical incidents could have strategic consequences. I alert you to something that happened on the Eilat Road a couple years ago when some jihadis wanted to create a firefight between Israel and Egyptian border policemen, were successful in doing so, Israel inadvertently killed some Egyptian border policemen and there was a lynching riot in the middle of Cairo and they wanted to, to you know to ransack the Israeli embassy of Cairo and as a matter of fact to this very day there's been no suitable replacement you had to get the Israeli diplomats in jalabiyas and an Arab headdress and snuck out of the building um, so here was a tactical border incident which what is it you know tactical things happen but it could have had strategic consequences and led to the collapse of the peace treaty. So the idea of porous borders is, is an important element as we go through the 21st century. Let me just do a little hopscotch of three hot spots that I would like you to, you know, if I were you here, want to focus on and say where, where we stand on these issues. How does it relate to Israel? And, and uh, what are the implications for, for the United States uh, going forward? I would start with Egypt, which I just mentioned. Egypt, in a certain way, looks a little better now than it did a year ago. Uh, for if you're standing in Israel, and I just met with some senior uh, security officials in, in Israel, um, including the, the Defense Minister Moshe Yalon and, and others. And what's clear is that a year ago, when I was there, and I try to go about four times a year, if I can. Um, it, what's clear is that, um, that a year ago they were worried that Egypt would break the treaty. And there was this fear that here's the centerpiece of Israel's regional strategy since 1979, peace with Egypt. Remember, Israel had wars with Egypt 1948, 1956, 1967. If you want to get technical, a war of attrition in 69 and 70, the war of 73 you know, the Yom Kippur War, there were all these wars, and once Israel had peace with Egypt, 
the interstate wars, you know, but it was having also these wars with Syria, stopped uh, in the sense that without Egypt, nobody made war against Israel. Egypt is now a country of 90 million people. So the fear was that this is about to collapse. And again, we should never be complacent. It could still happen. You never know what incidents, like I said, tactical incidents could have strategic consequences. But for the most part, a, a turning point seems to have come in November where Morsi, uh, the, the pr president of Egypt of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Hamas was convinced that Morsi was giving them the kind of the big brother support and Israel wouldn't dare attack Hamas and Gaza because they would have Morsi uh, to answer to. But Israel wasn't afraid of, of Egypt and uh, when you know, got Hamas hit Israeli cities, Israel with the Iron Dome. I mean, it, it sounds like something out of a fantasy book, you know, was knocking them out of the sky, I think, at an 85% success rate, which people would say, wow, who would have believed that? And thanks to the United States and the funding there, too, and Israeli technology, it was an amazing sight to behold. But Morsi, at the end of the day, helped broker the ceasefire. He won't meet with Israelis to this day, and therefore, I want to be very careful not that anything I say here is misinterpreted. That he is as if, like, what was, existed with Mubarak. He doesn't meet Israelis. But he's happy that the Israelis meet the Egyptian military. Or that Israel meets the Egyptian intelligence services, the Mukhabarat, their internal security people. And he has actually intercepted more um, rockets that have come from Iran via sometimes Sudan up through the Red Sea, you know, to um, through Jordan, I mean, through the Sinai, if we could see here, you know, sometimes it goes from Iran here and Bandar Abbas and these places and, and through the Red Sea, Sudan, up through here into Sinai. Here is the Sinai-Gaza border, I mean, right over here, this area here, and they go through these tunnels and then they're fired from Gaza into Israel. So the good news is that um, He's intercepted more. He's also blocked a lot of tunnels. He claims 250 tunnels. I don't think that's enough. I mean, it's a 12 kilometer area. It's a small area. When they say 250, it means there's a lot of exit and entrance ramps, but a lot of rockets are smuggled in from. Because why has he done it? Not because he's a Zionist, but because he's afraid of the jihadis here who just kidnapped this week five Egyptians and they were freed by Egypt. So you have a situation that Hamas was counting on Egypt to be in their corner, and they haven't. They also seem to buy into what I would call, I don't know if there's a better word for it, but the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that um, the Jews run America. So if he's okay with the Jews, the United States will give him a free hand internally to deal with his internal enemies. Now, I think that theory has been buttressed by the fact that their foreign currency reserves, I always think economics are important in understanding these developments, you know, they had $35 billion in foreign currency reserves before the fall of Mubarak. Today, it's under $13 billion. Now, that is nothing in terms of money, $13 billion. It may sound a lot of money to us, of course, but to a country of 90 million people, you need about 15 billion just to do ongoing churning of three months of wheat and fuel and all sorts of imports. I mean, I think Saudi Arabia is 440 billion. I think the company Apple Computer, whether they keep their money offshore or not, they clearly have over 100 billion dollars in foreign currency reserves. I think China is 4 trillion. To have 13 billion is nothing. So if the United States Congress is giving him 1.2 billion dollars in military aid, that is not a small thing. And the people who have been supportive of it, I think you see the Israeli ambassador of, of in Washington, Michael Oren and others, because the belief that this money is tied to the treaty, they keep the treaty, Israel supports aid to Egypt. And again, this may sound upside down to many of you, but I think there's a belief that um, that the Egyptian military is Israel's, one of Israel's best friends. And in general, in the Arab world, Israel's relationships are strongest with militaries and intelligence services. 
in Turkey, not an Arab country, but in the Middle East, until it was clipped by Erdogan, the leader of Turkey. Israel's had a, an amazing honeymoon with the Turks, has had a great relationship with the Egyptian military, and the Jordanian military are in and out of Israel all the time, and Israel's are there the same way. Why? They share similarities. None of them want Iranian influence in the Middle East. None of them want Al-Qaeda's influence in the Middle East. None of them want Hezbollah's influence in the Middle East. None of them want Hamas's influence in the Middle East. And they all want some stability and a modicum of prosperity. That's what the Israelis want. That's what the Egyptian military wants. And the Egyptian military has not had to fight a war since 1973. Israel sees the Egyptian military as a moderating force, a counterbalance, if you will, against the Brotherhood. And a belief, if all of a sudden they've got no money coming in, their influence in the Egyptian internal system, it cuts the legs out from under them. Their only ability to have influence is that they bring, they bring home the, the bacon, so to speak. I shouldn't say that about a Muslim country or a Jewish country. But they, they, they deliver. The U.S. helps them. The U, but they know if they start a war, they get no spare parts. They get no military assistance. So Israel is supportive of them, which no one would have imagined at an era of, of a Muslim Brotherhood leadership. Now that could change. I'm not here saying this will always be this way. And you might say, wait till the Brotherhood consolidates its a, a power in 20 years, and, and that will change. But I think in the meantime, the Israeli view is, you don't have so many allies out there in the region. Keep the allies you got. And give them something, you know, give them something to lose. They, they need to have something to gain that, that they are a force in the internal decision-making structure. So therefore Israel has been supportive of Egypt. Now, what's happened though is that if they thought anti-Semitically that, uh, that by getting, keeping the peace they would be spared domestic criticism, they were wrong, the Brotherhood, because the liberals have been much fiercer than they could have imagined. And it's unclear if they could deliver. The best case scenario is clearly that the Brotherhood somehow is so overwhelmed by economic challenges, they moderate in power. But I don't see that right now. I see them digging in that they are so ideologically blinded to what is needed when the world says, here, we want to give you $4.8 billion, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the, then the EU will give more, and this one will give more, and that one will give more, and it will add up to about $10 billion. They're not willing right now to, do, to take the medicine, because the medicine means cutting subsidies, and they don't want to cut subsidies because cutting subsidies makes you unpopular, and they want to win. They have an election cycle coming up in the fall. So the Brotherhood is, is, is treading water, and they face with the limits of their influence in, in certain places. I wouldn't underestimate their commitment to ideology, though. I wouldn't want to write them off, you know, check the box and say, don't have to ever worry about Egypt again. I don't think that's the case. But there's been a convergence between their need for money, their desire for stability, their fear of jihadis in the Sinai, and a belief that the tunnel system of Hamas is somehow reinforcing that, and Israel's opposition to Hamas. So there's been a certain convergence that has occurred that has meant that Israel's fears about Egypt breaking the treaty has not materialized. But clearly, if you're an Israeli military planner, you have to worry about all sorts of contingencies going forward. So I don't want to be misinterpreted that I think that this is a guarantee in the future. But so far, it's hell. Now, Syria. And just coming from Jordan, and um, I, I got to really be very fortunate in meeting uh, with two people who I see as at the top of the political system and, and next to the king um, during my visit there this week. So this is kind of hot off the presses. Um, it's my first talk since I've come back, obviously. But it was really striking to me how both Jordan and Israel, for very different reasons, have an interest in, in, a, in a one Syria policy. And I'm going to go and explain it right here. OK, here's Syria. Um, there's Jordan underneath, right? Here's Israel. The Golan Heights is here. Lebanon is here, Iraq is here, Turkey's here. Damascus, right? The capital, right here. So, where are we? The Jordanians come at this from a purely 
uh, resource-driven situation. They're being overwhelmed by refugees, okay? They've got, they tell me, I mean, the number's are either 500 to 600,000, depend on who you believe that they're coming over the borders. Some are in camps, but many are not in camps. 60%, I believe, are mixed in the cities. If you're talking about, let's say it's 500,000, but there's only a country of 5 million. That's 10% of Jordan. Imagine if all of a sudden we had 30 million uh, people who suddenly came to our shores. Maybe even, you say, Canadians. But the Canadians are wealthier and they wouldn't be in refugee camps. <laughs> but it o could overwhelm a, a very cash-strapped country very easily. And as was told to me um, by one of the senior Jordanians, um, we got 45,000 Syrian kids in the Jordanian public school system suddenly that just showed up. So how does a country that has, still has Iraqi refugees from the, the wave of sectarianism in Iraq in 2006 and 7 suddenly cope with 500 to 600,000? And they all like to remind me that doesn't include um, 300,000 plus migrant workers that tend to come over the Syrian border to work in Jordanian agriculture on a seasonal basis. So their view is they're, they're being overwhelmed and their fear is that by the end of this year they will have a million refugees from Syria. And they don't know how to cope. And you just see even driving in Amman that I can't pr prove that the traffic jams are because of wealthier Syrian refugees with cars or they bought cars, I can't prove. But uh, you see the roads are clogged too, I can tell you. But it is, it is a huge drain on them and they don't know how this is going to end. They're asking me and I'm asking them. And uh, now, so for, for their fear is they don't like Bashar. They've never trusted the Assad family. The Assad family doesn't trust the Hashemites of Jordan. They think, you know, you have a covert relations with the Israelis. You even have a treaty with the Israelis. How can we trust you? They like, they've always prided themselves on their radicalism. And that might be more important if you're a minority regime in Syria. 12% of the, of, of the Syrian population are Alawites, an offshoot of the Shiites. And they have been dominating Syria, certainly for the last 40, 45, 50 years uh, under Hafez al-Assad the father, and uh, you got 70% of the country uh, are Sunni, and they're under the boot of the minority. So if you're a minority, you've got to out-Arab the Arabs. You've got to be more, you know, more extreme because you've got to prove your credentials, even though you're not from the mainstream of the population. So they've always said, we're the heartbeat of Arabism, etc. But now they are in this brutal uh, civil war, and where they're doing most of the slaughtering, it seems to me, 80,000 people have been killed there, tragically. That doesn't include, like I say, 1.4 million refugees, if you count, not just Jordan, but some have gone into Lebanon and Turkey. 1.4 million altogether, and the number is growing. Um, so, and then there's other people displaced, millions who are not refugees, but have been displaced. So, this conflict is metastasizing in a way that's not just affecting Syria, but it's affecting the neighbors. And they want to know, where is this going? Is this going to destabilize our country in Jordan or, or in these other places? So there's a lot of nervousness. Um, and I must say, one of the things that I come back with from the trip was I thought they would be more excited about arming the rebels. Um, and again, I'm sorry, I hate to, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to anyone, uh, you know, who's gone through health problems, but they used the cancer analogy with me. They said, look, if you have stage one cancer, you have a lot of options, but at stage four, you don't have that many options uh, as much as you did at stage one. So we want a political solution because we're afraid if Bashar leaves, the whole country, it's not just the regime unravels, the country disintegrates. And that's what I want to talk to you about now which is the disintegration of a country. And, you know, it's so, the whole idea sounds crazy, you know, a disintegration of a country, we're not used to that. It's one thing to say, you know, new regime. But what do you tell me a country disintegrates? Well, what I'm saying is this. You've got the coastal area here. This is where the Alawites live. And there's also a big naval base that is the Russians' foothold in the Mediterranean. You would think 
with the end of the Cold War, people wouldn't think in these Cold War terms, but the Russians clearly do. And they are 100% behind Bashar. And um, their view is that uh, they don't want to risk the space, that a new regime could come along. And they will say, you're with the Ancien regime, you're with the old people, the older regime, you know, we don't want you anymore. They also want to block things at the UN. They'll say, this is an internal matter. If you start down that slippery slope, uh, what about Chechnya or Dagestan or one of these places that have been in the news because of the Boston bombing? Are you going to intervene there? You know, so where does it end? And uh, so for a variety of reasons, I think there's a lot of focus on plan B already, which is if the country comes apart, how does it fracture? So you've got the, the, the Shia, uh, the, the Alawites, that's 12% largely along the coast. Now, we've, in the news has been this place, Al-Qusair, right southwest of Homs. Homs is where there's a lot of ethnic cleansing because the Alawites clearly want, a, 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 like, would like to see no more Sunnis there. If this Syria is going to fall apart, this is Alawistan. And uh, they want it to be as Alawite as possible. Why is this area so important? Well, first of all, and why are thousands of Hezbollah people coming into this town to fight? Because there's some key roads. If you're leaving from Damascus, you know, to, to the Alawite area, you need to, this is strategic that overlooks the roads. And the Hezbollah people are hoping like, we'll, with, we'll redraw some of the maps from World War I. I know this to you sounds crazy, but nothing, nothing is sacrosanct in the Middle East anymore. Let's just create an enclave where the Alawites and the Hezbollah of the Bekaa Valley, you know, we're friends, so we'll, we'll, we'll just redraw it this way. And the Israelis tell me, and I, but the Pentagon has not confirmed this to me, that some of the chemical depots have been moved here as if to say, don't mess with us Alawites, this is our bastion, this is our fortress. Now you've got the Kurds, that everybody likes Kurds. They're up here, and they're in Turkey and Iraq, and every, they're the most pro-Western, and some call them the Jews of the Arab world, and etc. They will have their home state too, in this enclave view, if Syria falls apart. And they're Druze near the Golan Heights, and down here. But the big massive area is the Sunni stand. A lot of it is desert. And they could hook up with the Sunni of Iraq. There are a lot of radical forces in both sides. But if they don't have the coast, right, because that's Alawite, again, you got to look at resources and economics and basics, okay? It's not always about ideology, but you will have a resource deprived area here. And that could breed radicalism. What the Jordanians know is that this fragmentation, I say it's like taking a glass and throwing it to the ground and see it splinter in all these areas, then Jordan's view is this is going to be a mess for a long time and the refugees are going to keep wanting a better life by going south. So their fear is they have got to keep Syria together. Now where does Israel fit in on all this? Israel likes what I call the ketovet, the accountability. They want to know, if someone messes with us, we mess with them. We know where you live. But if, if Syria fragments into, into shards, you don't know where anybody lives anymore. So who do you, who's your address? Who's accountable? Nobody's accountable. That's Israel's fear of Syria breaking apart. Now, Israel has learned a lesson from Lebanon, 1982 when they tried to have this grand strategy of getting Bashar Jamal as the president because they were working with the Falangists and they tried to have a Christian president who they thought was to their liking. It was all coming together until he was assassinated and then it all collapsed. A lot of people like to think of Israel as arrogant. I think they're more humble than they get credit for and I think Israel's lesson of 82 is you cannot social engineer an Arab country. It's beyond you. Syria is a massive place. And I think the Israeli view is to say, we cannot social engineer Syria. We don't know, you know, whoever we would back will be tainted. 
Oh, he's the Zionist, you know, supporters. So all Israel's doing is giving humanitarian assistance to people who need hospitals in the northern border. Uh, they don't publicize it, but it's a way of trying to give a humanitarian hand. And it's, and it's a wonderful, noble gesture by Israel that never gets credit for the, the good that it does. But, but in the big picture, Israel's view is don't intervene. And also, their fear is that the Jubhat al-Nusra, the, the jihadis, might take over. And then you might miss Bashar al-Assad uh, if the jihadis take over. So, but the other argument, and, and I think there's a lack of policy consensus at the top, that says the devil you know is the devil, because Bashar has got a relationship with the Iranians and Hezbollah. And any Sunni government might be horrible, but they don't have the double play combination of weapons, Iran, Damascus airport, Hezbollah. They're, you know, they're, that's a Shiite alliance. So if you have a Sunni government, they might be crazy jihadis, but they don't, will not have the Iranian and Hezbollah links the way this regime does. So I would argue there's a lack of policy consensus in Israel, but that is, seems to morph, I mean, it seems to have kept no, each side not intervening, and I think Netanyahu being risk averse is saying, this isn't for us, you know, this is, this is too volatile. We, all we could do is play defense, and, uh, and Yalon has said that publicly now which is Israel's got to keep its eye on, on like a laser, on, on, the, on the weapons depots. It's got to focus on what I call like a clearance sale, a going out of business sale, a Bashar al-Assad, you know, as he gets weaker and he needs his bala in al Qusair, you know, you know, for plan B, you know, for the Alawite enclave, his ability to withstand his bala pressure is going to be harder and harder. Because they'll say, look, we're fighting for you. We're your only friends, us and the Iranians. The Russians will give us some sort of weapons, but who will do the fighting? It's us. Uh, so you gotta help us too. We help you, but you help us. What do you want? We want the, some of the most advanced weapon systems against Israel. So Israel's view is play defense here. Um, stay focused on where's the weaponry. And so they hit this center of a, an arms depot in the Damascus area. Fatah won tens, surface to surface. I think they have a 119 mile range that, that could hit Israeli cities very easily. And they went after that. You can imagine on the coast, they have this system called the Yahunt. Uh, I realize I'm near a naval port. So I think this is the, the, the military people know that this is a, a weapon system that's one of the most advanced in the world that's anti-ship. The Israelis say they can blow Israeli ships out of the port before they leave the port. It's a Russian system that was either given or sold to Syria that the fear is that Hezbollah will lay its hands on it. So basically, the, the Israeli focus is stay focused, keep your eye on the ball. And then you've got Amir Eshel, the head of the Israeli Air Force, who announced yesterday that if Bashar suddenly disappears, we're worried, he said, about the looting of these strategic weapons depots. And then we're going to pounce on that. So he was trying to warn, like, if this regime falls, this is, this is, it's, it's going to be the weapons depots that are going to suck Israel in. They don't want to get sucked in on the ground. They just don't want the weapons, the advanced weaponry, to be taken by another party. So you can say, well, we've had a, a Lebanese civil war in 1975 to 89, but here we've got more regional players and we've got more advanced weaponry at stake, and Israel's focus is on the advanced weaponry as I see it. So that's just a sense of like how to look at Syria because there's a lot of moving parts here and um, I think that that's something you know to think about. I you know I think of a, a guy like Amir Eshel and uh, I, mean, I said to a few of you that I you know he's someone I, I've known him as the head of the Air Force that in, he's a children of survivors and in in 2003 um, when I met him he had just done a, a flyover of Auschwitz. You may have seen there's some iconic photos. If you go to any Israeli general's office in the Kirya, in the defense ministry, in the IDF headquarters, they all have that photo. As, as if to say, that's why there's an Israeli army never again. Uh, and if you look, by the way, at some of the generals, more than the diplomats, I think, and more than government officials and other agencies, 
I find they're disproportionately the children of Holocaust survivors because they dedicated themselves to lives in the military because of the trauma of their parents and grandparents. So that this Amir Eshel, who, who did the flyover of Auschwitz as a sign you know, of the Magen David of the Jewish star flying over, as if to say it's not as if you know, there, was a, there wasn't a Holocaust, there wouldn't be in Israel, but maybe if there was an Israel, you wouldn't have had the level of the Holocaust as, as we see it. That he's now the head of the Air Force is, is, is kind of interesting. And he's the one who's saying, you know, we're not going to let the worst people get the worst weapons. So, and the last piece I want to talk to you about is Iran. Because that something else is in the news. And, oops. Okay, here we go. I think that's here. There we go. All right, Iran, right? Farther away, here's Tehran, right? And here's Iraq, here's Jordan, here's Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Egypt, just uh, Saudi Arabia, all right? Um, and you've heard about the nuclear issue here a lot, and it's somehow been kind of lost in the, in the, in, in the focus, given everything else that's going on. But I'll tell you a story of Sam Lewis, who was the U.S. ambassador to Israel in 1981, when um, uh, Israel hit... Uh, hit the Osirak reactor. And for me, it was kind of very poignant that a person who also spoke at this conference I was at in Jordan was Amos Yadlin, uh, who was a former head of military intelligence and Air Force pilot. But he was the, a young Air Force pilot in 1981. He was the first guy to hit the reactor. And uh, he went on to a 40-year career in the Army. And so you never know how history plays itself out that some guy who was an, a young Air Force pilot in 81, he devoted his life to, and he's been very focused on the Iran issue. He was, uh, he was, um, he was, uh, um, he was at my institute for a year at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy in Washington along with Dennis Ross and myself and other colleagues. But, um, so Sam Lewis tells a story that he had to write a cable, and I heard this from Sam, and, and he said, 1981, people, I had to write a cable. How did we miss it? How did we Americans miss the Israeli strike? We didn't see it coming. He said, because Menachem Begin, when he was the leader, you know, he used to always talk to me about Iran, about Iraq, about the Osirak reactor, and what a threat it is, and what are we going to do about it in the U.S. And at a certain point, he stopped talking about it. So I assume when he stopped talking about it, it became less important. What I didn't realize is that it was Israeli radio silence. When they stop talking, <laughs> that's when you start worrying. <laughs> so he said that was, that was his lesson of 1981. So just because we don't hear about it as much, I think it would be a big mistake to not to talk about it. One of the things I do at the Wash Institute is run a, a, a track two, we call it, a, a workshop of senior Americans and Israelis who, who just left government, some famous names, um, and to try to brainstorm on this issue. So I, I've been immersed in this, and I could say to you that this is, oops, that this is a huge issue that we should not uh, forget about. Now, th there's been like four different approaches to this approach uh, until now. One is diplomacy. Uh, clearly, if you could find a diplomatic solution here, you would want to do so because as long as you can verify it. I mean, people don't trust the Iranians, so a piece of paper isn't going to do anything. But if it's something that's verifiable, Ronald Reagan once said, trust but verify, that would be, I think, the ideal. And maybe in the Q&A I could get into that, of where the state of the diplomacy is, but so far it has not borne fruit. A second approach has been one of covert activity that you've seen, you've heard about Stuxnet and these centrifuges kind of spinning off their wheels and, you know, kind of not working and setting the Iranian program back. Um, but we don't know what is a Stuxnet 2.0, 3.0, that these worms, these viruses have mutate in certain ways. And you also have, there's been killing of scientists uh, on the Iranian program. Now, historically, when it came to Osirak, they did this too, the, the killing of scientists, but it didn't change the trajectory of the program. So it's unclear here too if that is really going to do it. Another big thing that is focused on has been sanctions. And if we'd be sitting here 
a few years ago, and I would say to you, the European Union is going to put an embargo on Iranian oil, you'd say, no way. The Europeans, they don't have the spine for that. And if they have uh, an economic troubles, they'll throw the sanctions overboard in two seconds. But the fact is, with all the European economic problems, they have stuck to the sanctions. And, and, and Khamenei has called them brutal, the Ayatollah. But it has not yet had an impact on changing the course of the trajectory of the program. A fourth approach uh, has been, people say, regime change. But the United States, having been burned by the whole Iraq war and regime change, uh, is not about to do that. And neither Israel believes, like I said, about Syria, that that's too big for, for either. So that is not really on the table. The question is, if the diplomacy doesn't work, will there be military action? And there's no doubt that the U.S. has superior capabilities to Israel. The U.S., we have something, and I'm not saying anything, God forbid, that's classified. It's all open source. Uh, we have something called the MOP. The MOP is the Massive Ordnance Penetrator. It's a 30,000 pound bomb that, if dropped in the right way, could cut through a mountain, and then it blows up at the bottom of the mountain. And Iran has got one of their main programs for nuclear fuel um, in a mountain right outside the religious city of Qom, which I don't know if we have up here, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a, you know, it's, they did it on purpose because they figured no one would want to get near a religious city not 30 kilometers, 20 miles away. Um, but to carry the MOP, you need a B-2 or B-52 bomber because to carry a 30,000 pound bomb, the F-15 or the F-16 that's a staple for Israel, it's not strong enough, it's not big enough. You need certain runways for that. Israel doesn't have a MOP. Israel doesn't have a B-2. Uh, they don't have pilots to fly it. They don't have the runways for it. So clearly the U.S. could do a better job. Uh, while the U.S. and Israel share an objective that neither wants Iran to get a bomb because of the, uh, largely many of the same reasons. For the U.S., we see that Iran with a bomb means that the the most dangerous region becomes much more dangerous. If there's, a Saudi, if there's an Iranian bomb, the big rivals of the Iranians, they are Shiite Persians, these are Sunni Arabs, or the Saudis. They'll say, what, they get one, we don't get one? So the Saudis will want one. And there's plenty of reports that they have financed the Pakistani bomb, so it won't be that hard. The Turks, they'll say, we're the most important regional player. We don't get a bomb? The Arabs, the Egyptians are broke, as I've said to you before, but it'll be a matter of time. So you will have a nuclear arms race in the Middle East, um, and the most dangerous region will become much more dangerous. And for us in the United States, nuclear nonproliferation has been a signature of American foreign policy since World War II, the aftermath. We call it the NPT, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, but if Iran gets a bomb and it has a domino effect, you could throw the NPT in the trash can. So this is major implications. And given that it is a dangerous part of the world, we don't know if they're going to proliferate to Hezbollah or Hamas, dirty bombs or things like that. We just don't know. So it's, whether you're an Israeli or an American, it is something that the policy is to prevent not just to contain. People say, well, will you contain the Soviets in the Cold War? Why not contain them? The difference is that in the Cold War, it was binary, right? It was two big, big camps, uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Here, we've got all these proxy groups that have their hand on the trigger. Local, regional conflicts can easily, you know, blow up. And we had in the Cold War NATO which we see here in Virginia. And we had 500,000 troops in Europe as a tripwire. We don't have 500,000 troops in the Middle East. We had embassies in Moscow, an American embassy in Moscow. We had a Russian embassy in Washington. You read all the accounts of the Cuban Missile Crisis, how Bobby Kennedy met with Russian ambassadors. Certainly since the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had hotlines. We don't have anything like this anywhere on any level with the Iranians. 
neither we the US with Iran or Israel with Iran certainly and Israel's view is a Jewish history when your enemies say they want to wipe you off the map you got to believe them so they have to take it seriously so in many ways there's a convergence between the US and Israel view which is containment doesn't work meaning you can't live with the bomb you have to prevent them and the good news is that the US Israel military coordination is fantastic you might not read about it in the Virginia pilot or in the Washington Post or in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal but the assessments of where Iran is in its effort is amazing you'd have to be a veritable air traffic controller to keep up with the visits going back and forth between Israel and the United States of the militaries and a lot of the visits are not announced below a certain level and sometimes they have this video conferencing this VTC where you don't even leave your office and you're able to consult from the Pentagon to the Kirya in Tel Aviv so the best the good news is the, the consultation is outstanding and the objectives are similar but the windows are different <laughs> because the capabilities are different Israel is also haunted by the fact that the US track record as great as the United States is has not been always perfect in identifying when a country goes nuclear we were good with Libya we're able to identify that in time but when it came to Pakistan when it came to North Korea it was too early too early oops too late and that's something Israel can't afford so I would say Israel's first choice is the diplomacy that that diplomacy if it's verifiable that it's successful because you would like to solve issues peacefully and I want I don't want to be misinterpreted by anyone leaving this room I think that's the preferable approach if it's achievable if it's verifiable second Israel's second choice is that the US has the mop the, US has the B2 they have superior capabilities Israel would like to just back off because they think the United States would do a superior job but their third choice is you don't always get your first two choices in life and there might be a gray zone where and it has nothing to do with you trust the president you don't trust the president but the question of their nuclear fuel the enriched uranium uh, are they able to break out from reactor grade fuel to, to weapons grade fuel in a, in a very short period so the Israelis like to ask the Americans will you know it in time and will you act on what you know maybe it's a 30 to 40 day period and it's based on when the IAEA the International Atomic Energy Agency gets access the Iranians don't always like the IAEA and their view is I know this is sounding very primitive what I'm about to say but it's the truth is it's not like you live in an ideal world where you're sitting in Vienna at the International Atomic Energy Agency headquarters and you're watching Iranian nuclear sites and plasma in real time no you have to knock on the mountain uh, every two weeks at Fordo and I almost have this vision of like Kodak and stomatic film but it is they have not agreed to update their agreement with the IAEA since 1969 while well, film technology has changed since 1969 what if they decide it's we're about to have a religious holiday we're not gonna let the IAEA come visit this time or we're mad at the IAEA because we think you share too much with the Americans and the Zionists so we'll call you spies and we'll punish you and say come back in two months but if the whole window is 30 to 40 days that's a problem so all I'm saying is it's it's very difficult and in the q and get into this even more about the red line of Netanyahu uh, but I think I'm saying is that it's a very difficult issue and um, I'll say one word about this red line but that Netanyahu poor put this line you all saw it with the magic marker at the UN in September and some of the good news is that Iran after increasing increasing their uranium levels have actually the last few IEA reports show that this more advanced form of enrichment the 20 percent enrichment which if it reaches a critical mass of 250 kilo within 30 to 40 days it's a, they break out and they have a, the fuel they need for a nuclear bomb so the good news is that you could say maybe this is a form of communication that the Iranians have backed off that it shows that that, that level of 20% uranium has dropped 
where they've taken the uranium gas and turned it into powder, oxidizing it into oxide powder. But they can also reverse that course. So can Iran circumvent the red line is a big question for the intelligence communities of both countries. I'll stop on that point. My point is that these are a lot of challenges. And sometimes you could get overwhelmed by these challenges and you forget all the amazing opportunities. And Israel at 65, is, it's a great milestone. And you look at all the high-tech world, you have friends there, you have relatives, you go back and forth, you're reading things on the websites and the emails. You know how vibrant Israel is, you know, despite all of its enemies that this is a country, despite all the wars, that has built a thriving democracy. It's got to address the Palestinian issue, which I'm happy to discuss in the Q&A, which is critical for Israel. But at the same time, it has been able to build a high-tech economy that is the envy of the world. It's got the second most startups on the NASDAQ outside of the United States, and has earned the, the, the nickname Startup Nation, as you have heard. So, it's important that we talk about discerning the dangers, we don't lose sight of seizing opportunities and making sure that we have a balance, an equilibrium between the opportunities and the threats. That it's not all threat driven, it's an amazing country. But people ask me all the time, David, as I conclude here, they ask me, you know, are you, but are you a pessimist, you know about all these threats, or, you know, but I see how Israel is thriving economically. And I said, you know, people say to me, but all these countries with these suicide fanatics and Hezbollah and Hamas and Iran and these jihadis, I mean, how do you sleep at night? <laughs> but I like to think of it this way, that I'm a long-term optimist very much because I've seen the challenges of Ben-Gurion. I've read about it. I wasn't there, but I read about it. And I think Ben-Gurion would do anything to live in 2013. Instead of having five Arab armies attack them, he's got to worry that the Arab armies don't fall apart because he, to patrol their side of the border. He would love to have some of these challenges. So whenever we think we're challenged by all these fanatical people who, who want to kill themselves and take Israelis with them, I keep thinking of the resilience of the people of Israel, that Israel's will to live is greater than its enemies' will to die. And so in the most literal sense, Am Yisrael Chai, the Jewish people live. Thank you all very much. <laughs>